It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, my first question this morning is to the Premier. You know, families are watching across Ontario with growing concern as uh, our province goes backwards, slides backwards in our fight against co the COVID-19 pandemic. People have been desperately waiting for news from the Premier about the plan that the Ford government has apparently been working on uh, since uh, the midsummer. Today, CBC News reports that they have a copy of a plan which is entirely incomplete, despite us being in the midst of the second wave and has virtually no investment, none whatsoever, containing, uh, in containing outbreaks for sc in schools and no investment, virtually nothing, to address the serious risks in long-term care. Why, with the second wave of this pandemic upon us, is this government still scrambling to chase the crisis? The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Speaker. And in fact, we are prepared for a second wave, which is happening in other countries in the world and across Canada as well. We knew this was going to happen. We have been preparing for it. The plan that, was, uh, that appeared in the CBC article was a very early draft of the plan. We've been working on it for several months. What was appeared then was a, a portion of what we're planning to do, and we are unveiling our plan um, as we speak. We've indicated several aspects of it, but we have a comprehensive keeping Ontarians safe, preparing for future waves of COVID-19 plan that contains six elements that is based on protecting our most vulnerable citizens in long-term care homes, retirement homes, other co congregate living settings, and in education as well. Response? I will be happy to speak about the plan further in my supplemental response. Thank you. A supplementary question. Well, Speaker, ever since cases began to increase weeks and weeks ago, the Premier's unpreparedness and feigned surprise have garnered widespread criticism throughout the medical community. The backlogs of tests are growing. The Premier couldn't even say yesterday how many people had been turned away from testing. Cash strap hospitals say the system is, and I quote, heading for a crash. And to quote the medical officer of the Michael Guerin Hospital, the plan is wholly insufficient. Why has the Premier waited until the second wave is well underway to even begin to take any action? Mr. Health. Thank you, Speaker. Well, in fact, our Keeping Ontarians Safe, Preparing for Future Waves of COVID-19 plan is integrated, it's complex, it addresses all of these issues. It hasn't even been fully rolled out to the public yet. That is what we are in the process of doing because it is so um, in integrated and complex that each individual part of it deserves its own day to be discussed because there are so many elements to it. The plan is focused on six different areas, one, maintaining strong public health measures, including the continued expansion of testing and case and contact management. We are building on what we have already built very quickly in the last few months, but we're building on that again. And I will remind the, everyone here that we have now exceeded over 40,000 tests per day in Ontario, and we are building on that. We will be close to 50,000 very shortly. We're implementing the largest flu immunization program in Ontario's history. We're accelerating efforts to reduce health service backlogs. And Thank you very much. And the final supplementary. Well, Speaker, a plan to deal with the se second wave of this pandemic should have been in place before the second wave actually happened. It should have been in place before. Now we have an incomplete plan that is several weeks late and billions of dollars short. Instead of a plan to cap class sizes, to staff long-term care homes, and to end the chaos in testing sites, we see a government that is once again chasing the crisis, and a premier that is angrily blaming everyone but himself for the lack of preparedness in this province. Why, with the second wave of the pandemic upon us, is this government still scrambling? Mr. Health. 
Thank you, Speaker. And I would say uh, through you, Speaker, to the Leader of the Official Opposition that we have a comprehensive plan that we are already implementing. We have already taken steps and have over the, all of the summer months to be prepared for a dramatic increase in the number of cases that we have coming forward of COVID-19 with the flu season approaching, with the issues that we have in trying to deal with the backlogs, the procedures and surgeries that we had to postpone during wave one, and with the increase in patients that we're receiving because we are doing the infection prevention and control in our long-term care homes by decanting some of those uh, residents back into hospital where they will continue to be safe and healthy. We have invested hundreds of millions of dollars into implementing all of these measures and dealing with the situation so that today we can handle those increased volumes in terms of testing, the lab tests that need to be done, and making sure that we can keep our vulnerable populations safe. That's Response. what we are doing now. The next question. Once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, the leaked plan, the government's leaked plan, is, is especially concerning for residents of long-term care homes. Yesterday, there were already 31 homes in outbreak, and that compares to only 19 the weekend, on the weekend. So in a couple of days' time, it went from 19 to 31. Long-term care operators, staff, residents have all been imploring this government to uh, adopt uh, infection and, uh, control and prevention plans and help them to deal with that. But the incomplete plan falls drastically, drastically short of what's absolutely needed for our long-term care system. So my question is, why is protecting seniors in long-term care missing from the plan? Minister of Health. Well, the draft plan that was uh, received by the CPC was just a draft. It was an early draft that went through several different iterations dealing with students, both uh, primary, secondary and post-secondary students, dealing with protecting our vo most vulnerable citizens, people in long-term care homes, in retirement homes, in other congregate living settings for people with perhaps intellectual disabilities. All of that is contained as part of our plan because we need to limit the community spread, which is now uh, dealing with uh, people in our community and moving into some of our long-term care homes, which we are dealing with as well. Uh, my colleague, the Minister of Long-Term Care, and I are working together to deal with the situation with our long-term care homes to make sure we can continue with the testing that needs to be done and also to limit the community transmission, which is why we are talking to people on a daily basis about how they need to please continue Response. to follow public health measures, keeping that physical distancing, wearing a mask, frequent hand hygiene, and staying home if you feel ill. That is it. Thank you. The supplementary. Speaker, in a letter to long-term care operators earlier this month, month, the government literally walked away from any responsibility for staffing shortages. And uh, I'm going to quote what, they, what the ministry has said to these homes. Staffing is ultimately the responsibility of the licensee. Homes that are part of a chain are encouraged to look to the chain to assist in addressing staffing issues. Going forward, the supply of hospital resources is becoming more scarce, and they may not be available to assist to this extent that you may require. The government is walking away from the help that long-term care needs. In other words, these homes are on their own. After the horrors of last spring, where the Premier promised that he wouldn't spare any expense to protect seniors in long-term care, why is he breaking his promise? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Uh, that is um, categor categorically wrong. I think this is a situation where uh, we have a comprehensive plan that will address the issues in long-term care to stabilize homes, and we have never stopped working on this. It has been continuous, in fact, with even more focus, knowing a second wave is coming to stabilize the homes, to stabilize the staffing. There is a robust plan. There, is do there are dollars behind it, and we are continuing to work with the IPAC, investing both capital and for, for modifications of homes and, as well, increased personnel. This is ongoing. 
and we are in consultation with our sector to understand their needs and continue to meet them, particularly with the IPAC situation. So I want to, uh, I want to remind you that we have never stopped working on this. It is our government's number one uh, priority, the safety and well-being of residents and staff in long-term care, and we will continue to focus on this. The final supplementary. Just uh, re repeated to the government is the result of the consultation. The result of the consultation the minister is talking about was basically a letter to long-term care home providers that they're on their own and they have to solve their own problem with staffing. The premier has yet to show any sort of plan to deal with the, cha the staffing challenges in our long-term care homes. In fact, he's making it clear that the government doesn't have one and has no intention of providing one. That's what that letter says. Now, we all know that the government hasn't done enough to get ready for the second wave in the first place, but in long-term care, this is literally a matter of life and death, and the deaths are occurring again in the second wave. So when will the government acknowledge the very real danger the second wave poses for residents of long-term care and make the desperately needed investments that operators, staff, residents and the government's own experts have been calling for? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you again, Speaker, and thank you for the question. I'll repeat, uh, next week we will be rolling out a comprehensive plan that addresses a robust number of long-term care issues, stabilizing homes, helping with IPAC, helping with staff. Uh, our homes need to be reminded that they need to do as much as they possibly can as well. But this is a collaborative effort. Uh, with multiple ministries, the Chief Medical Officer of Health, Ontario Health, Public Health Ontario, uh, Ottawa Public Health, where some of the homes are hardest hit with those outbreaks right now, but they are stabilizing. And I, I am receiving information every day. I'm in constant contact with the hospital involved and the, the medical officer of health in Ottawa to know what is happening on the ground. And our outbreaks, the majority Response. of those outbreaks have no resident cases. Wave one, we had many learnings from that, and we will continue to focus on long-term care. Thank you. The next question, the member for Timiskaming Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. The CBC is reporting that the government's leaked, now draft, but fully comprehensive plan will plow hundreds of millions of dollars into for-profit health care. That part's not a surprise. But for months, hospitals have pleaded with the government for funding and collaboration to deal with the pending crisis of a second wave. The public health care system is fully capable of carrying out surgeries and diagnostics when the government actually invests in public care. But this government, according to the plan, is choosing to ignore them. So now our hospitals are literally laying off nurses while the plan promotes for-profit clinics. Shame. 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 Why Order. is this government ramming through for-profit health care instead of investing in publicly paid for and publicly delivered health care that Ontarians deserve? Order. Mr. of Health to reply. Thank you, Speaker. That is categorically wrong, I would say to the member. Absolutely categorically Order. wrong. Our fall plan, and it was only a draft, I will continue to tell you, it was only a draft of that plan that the CBC received. It I'm going to ask the official opposition and the independent members to come to order. Minister of Health to reply. It has gone through several other iterations. It is changed significantly from the draft that uh, the CBC obtained. But I can tell you that what we are doing in our fall plan is, as part of our plan, is to work on the several hundred thousand tests and surgeries that were postponed because of the first wave. We don't want to do that anymore because people have been waiting. I'm sure you all have constituents who have been waiting for months 
to have knees or hips replaced or to have cardiac or cancer surgery. We don't want to have to do that anymore. But our public resources, our public hospitals are working as hard as they can. But we need to work through this backlog Ms. as Bond. we face a second wave of COVID-19 and as we face flu vaccinations and flu season coming forward. I will have more to say in my supplemental. The supplementary question. Bad enough that private health care was even in the draft plan. The hospitals need funding and support, not shifting precious public dollars into for-profit health care. The Ontario Hospitals Association said the plan for dealing with the backlog of health care should be built from the ground up in partnership with hospitals. They said, and I quote, it will need to be implemented by doctors, nurses, and other hospital staff who will need time and resources to continue mobilizing, end quote. Yet instead of working with hospitals, doctors, nurses, and frontline heroes, the government continues to listen to insiders with deep pockets. They're even issuing pink slips to nurses. Why is this government refusing to invest in public health care to cl clear these backlogs? But more importantly, why is there always money available for for-profit care when we have a public system Publicly delivered health care is what we need, and that's what we need to keep. Why are you always fighting you for it? Minister of Health to reply. There is absolutely no fight going on about that. We are investing hundreds of millions of dollars in our public hospitals to allow them to continue to deliver excellent patient-centered care. But we are in the middle of a pandemic. Have you noticed? We have hundreds of thousands of procedures that we have to move forward with. And we have also independent health facilities that have always been there. We're not creating anymore. They have always been there. And we need to use every resource that we can right now in order to deal with COVID and to deal with these procedures. And as a matter of fact, the Ontario Medical Association just issued a release yesterday where they are encouraging the government to provide necessary resources to increase capacity and enable more procedures and services, including Response. expanding independent health facilities. And so what we are trying to do Order. is to make sure that we use all of our public facilities. We have given hundreds of Order. millions of dollars to our hospitals, and they are doing excellent work. But the reality... The Leader of the Opposition has to come to order. The next question, the member for Chatham, Kent Leamington. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Minister, since day one, you've been a strong advocate of modernizing Ontario's burdensome building code. You've been focused on taking a complex document that was overlooked by previous governments and using it to stimulate our economy while maintaining Ontario's high standards for energy conservation and public, public safety. Our government is committed on reducing barriers to Ontario's manufacturers to keep the cost of construction affordable and at the same time make housing more affordable as well. Minister, I understand that on August 27, 2020, you and our Solicitor General signed the Reconciliation Agreement on Construction Codes. So, Minister, could you please share more about this exciting initiative with the House? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Speaker, and I want to thank the member for Chatham-Kent to uh, Leamington for his advocacy. I also want to thank him for uh, uh, some of the projects that uh, I got to tour in his riding. He's a, he's a real champion when it comes to uh, the housing file. Uh, our government is committed to reducing red tape and regulatory burdens that cause unnecessary delays, duplications, and barriers, and that's why I was excited to join with the Solicitor General in signing the Reconciliation Agreement on Construction Codes under the Canada uh, Free Trade Agreement last month. By taking uh, this very important step, our government is committed to further harmonizing Ontario's Building Code and Ontario's Fire Code with the National Construction Codes. This harmonization will reduce barriers related to trade, 
product manufacturing, building design, and maintenance. And we're also committed, Speaker, to continuing to work with our federal, Response. provincial, and territorial counterparts to reduce all unnecessary barriers to interprovincial trade while putting the people of Ontario first. Thank you, Speaker. To the supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And thank you, Minister, for your historic work on this file. And I'm also reassured to hear your continued commitment to further harmonize on building code with the national standard while ensuring that buildings in Ontario remain among the safest and most accessible in North America. Our government continues to work to cut unnecessary red tape. And I'm interested to hear more about what the reconciliation agreement entails and how it will help Ontario. So, Minister, could you please explain the key elements of this signed agreement? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thanks, uh, thanks again for that uh, excellent question. The, the reconciliation agreement contains uh, several key elements for our government. It will ensure timely and consistent adoption of construction codes across Canada so that the same rules are in place at the same time. Uh, it will also transform the national code development system, including a new uh, governance structure that's more responsive to both provinces and territories. And it will ensure there is digital access to free national construction codes right across Canada. Mr. Speaker, our government is committed to reducing barriers so Ontario's success across every sector of our economy, and the building code is just one example of that. Sure. Thank you for the question. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. This question is for the Premier. Speaker, it's been a week since the Conservative members defeated our motion to cap class sizes at 15 kids, and we're still hearing of more collapsed classes of 25, 30, with no way to keep our children socially, uh, physically distanced. But yesterday, the Premier told the press that classes were capped at 15 in Ottawa, in Toronto, in Peel. I, I have to ask, Mr. Speaker, why then are we hearing of collapsed kindergarten classes in the Ottawa area with 27 little ones, or in Toronto, in my own riding, with grade four classes of 30, or in Mississauga, where we have more kindergarten classes collapsed together with 25 or more kids? No, this is happening all across the province, Mr. Speaker. The government failed our students by holding back when they should have put those children first. Will the Premier correct that error today and give us a fully funded plan to protect our schools in a second wave? The Minister of Education to reply. Well, thank you, Speaker. The Premier is indeed correct in high schools, in the adapted models of Otto, of Peel, of Halton, of Toronto, of York, and many other boards across the province. In fact, this government did mandate a uh, maximum of 15 students on a blended model, taking the advice of the public health table. Mr. Speaker, we have really broke down the silos of government with, between the ministries of education and health care, ensuring that we defer and we work with and be informed by the public health table and our doctors at the COVID command table, working with the Minister of Health to ensure that our schools are safe, as noted as recently as this week by local public health officers. Every layer of prevention is in place to ensure that they are safe. We have ensured the funding is in place, the, the evidence has been informed by the Chief Medical Officer, and obviously will continue as we see this risk rise, do more, invest more, and be more prepared to, to deal with the second wave as well as with the flu campaign. Thank you. The supplementary. Speaker, uh, schools are not okay. Daycares are not okay. Virtual schools are not okay. Our province is not okay right now. Speaker, as of today, we have 31 more cases of COVID-19 in our schools. We're up to a total of 210 in 178 schools across this province, and we know that that's going to keep rising, unfortunately. Families across the province are watching those numbers very closely, wondering if their school is going to be next, worried how they're going to get time off work to wait in a day-long testing line. Speaker. Parent to parent, I need the Premier to understand the only thing worse than dealing with this uncertainty is knowing how hard it's going to be on our kids when they are forced out of schools again because this government failed them. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier look at what's happening on the ground, stop making these excuses, and bring forward a second wave plan that's going to keep us at a 15 cap for our schools and for our children? Minister of Education. 
Uh, well, thank you, Speaker. The Premier has been clear, as well as the Deputy Premier, that the government is increasing testing capacity province-wide, moving from 25 to 35 to 40 and upwards of 50,000, and I know that the Deputy Premier will be unveiling further plans to expand beyond that. Mr. Speaker, we have expanded uh, through pharmacies an additional 60 pharmacies available as of tomorrow for asymptomatic testing, Speaker. We are expanding capacity, including in our labs, within our schools, Speaker. Order. Within our schools, we benefit from the single largest Order. investment in the flu uh, vaccination, 700,000 more ordered, $70 million provided the to, member buy, for Davenport to come buy more vaccination that I know our young people uh, will uh, benefit from. And obviously, in the context of our schools, we're working very closely by the, with the Chief Medical Officer of Health to ensure those classroom numbers stay low, that the additional layers of prevention are Aunts. in place, and that we continue to follow the public health advice as we respond to COVID-19. The next question, the member for Don Valley East. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Leaked documents obtained by the CBC show that this government's last minute, presented a last minute plan includes sneaking private health care into Ontario, specifically around surgeries being performed by the private sector. Can the Premier tell this House what exactly this means and who actually made this recommendation? The Deputy Premier and Thank Minister you, Speaker. Uh, I will repeat once again that the a draft that was uh, obtained by the CPC was a draft. It has changed in, during that time. It addresses many of the issues that uh, you have raised, but the issue with respect to dealing with the several hundred thousand procedures and surgeries that were delayed as a result of Wave 1 are now being dealt with. People have waited long enough. They've already waited months yeah. to have orthopedic surgeries. They've waited for cancer surgeries, for cardiac surgeries. They shouldn't have to wait any longer. Our public hospitals are doing a wonderful job. They are working under very, very stressful circumstances. They are doing their best. We are taking a regional approach to dealing with some of those surgeries and procedures. But at a time like this, when we are in, during the course of an epidemic, we are in wave two. At this point, we are seeing our Response. case numbers rise, but we still need to complete those surgeries and procedures. And if some of our independent health facilities have that ability to help us, they should be doing that. We aren't creating any more of them. They have always been there. They have always been Thank you. Thank you very much. And the supplementary question. Uh, speaker, there is no secret about this government's agenda. Um, it's, uh, it's been known in the past that the Minister of Long-Term Care has advocated for the privatization of the health care system here in Ontario. But to use the pandemic, Order. but to use the pandemic, Mr. Speaker, as a way sure. to push privatization here in Ontario is a new low even for this government. Earlier this week, we found out that 100 public sector nurses were laid off in the Minister of Health's own riding. How could the government lay off nurses when we have a crisis in long-term care, we have a crisis in public education where cases are increasing, we have a crisis in testing where we're seeing people wait days to get tests and in lines for eight hours? How can they actually push privatization and fire nurses Order. during this pandemic? So we've seen the report, and it's starting to connect the dots. Question. Mr. Speaker. As we enter a second wave to this pandemic, can the Premier confirm to this House that not, not one single health care worker will be fired during the pandemic? Stop the clock. <laughs> Government side has to come to order. Start the clock. Minister of Health to reply. Thank you, Speaker. And I would say to the member opposite, through you, Mr. Speaker, that that is an absolutely ridiculous assertion. Here, here, here. That is absolutely incorrect. We believe in our public health care system. That is what we're trying to transform. We brought forward, before the pandemic hit us, we brought forward our plan to transform Ontario Health, to creation Order. of Ontario Health. If we had not created Ontario Health, can Order. you imagine getting 14 LINs to agree to a plan? We would be in a terrible situation. I, I apologize to the Minister of Health. The member for Don Valley East has to come to order. Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. We are in the midst of transforming our public health care system to make it uh, responsive to the needs of patients across order. this province. 
and to integrate care to make sure that people are receiving the care they need wherever they are, whether they're in hospital, whether they're in long-term care, or whether they're receiving home and community care. We are committed to public health care, Not, nothing private, but there are some private health facilities that have already existed in our system for many, many years through previous governments going Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll ask both sides of the House to come to order. The next question, the member for Niagara West. COVID-19 has impacted the systems and the services that Ontarians rely on day in and day out. Some of these impacts are seen by Ontarians in the way that we work, shop and eat. Others are less obvious and perhaps only noticed when they are not there when we look for them. So our justice system, which is one of the cornerstones of our life here in Ontario, is one that Ontarians may not always encounter, but when they do, they expect it to be there for them. On Tuesday, I know Ontario's justice partners marked the annual opening of the courts, and with it, it was an opportunity to reflect on the justice system, what they've learned in the past year, and the opportunities that can be improved in the justice system in the year ahead. So my question to the Attorney General is if he could tell the House and the people across this province what our government is doing to ensure that our justice system remains strong during COVID-19 and beyond. Thank you. The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for Niagara West for this question and for all his potential and, and ongoing input in so many practical areas. This is an important issue for Ontarians. It impacts all Ontarians, and the people in the province need to know the justice system will be there when they need it the most. They need to be able to access it. Earlier this week, I had the privilege of attending the opening of the courts virtually with the three chief justices of our, our province who are tremendous justice partners. The message I want delivered and the message I want all Ontarians to hear. We are, in fact, delivering and ensuring the justice system remains functional during COVID through the rapid implementation of online, remote and in-person matters. And yes, we will continue to build on the success to drive change that will improve the lives for all who need to access the justice system. Over the course of the summer, Mr. Speaker, we introduced several important initiatives to establish new and innovative ways of offering justice services remotely Response. in person and online. Mr. Speaker, more than 400 new filings online. We have access to data online that wasn't there before. We've modernized the states and wills, and I have more to say in my supplementary, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you. Uh, my thanks to the Attorney General for his response and for, for providing Ontarians with the assurance that the justice system here in Ontario is here for Ontarians when they need it. It's encouraging to hear that these modernization efforts were able to be implemented in short order. I know one of the things I've heard is that the amount of work that's been done in the last six months normally would take six years, and I want to thank the Minister for his advocacy in that. You know, Ontarians need to know that the strides that have been made uh, this summer will not go by the wayside as we continue our path to recovery here in Ontario. They need to know that they have a government that understands and is listening. So could the Attorney General please explain what the government is doing to ensure that these modernizations are sustained as we move forward? The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We have, in fact, we are transforming the system. We are not just automating the system. We are moving the system forward decades in a matter of months. Great. Our government has shown that we have the vision to bring forward practical change to the justice system. The changes we've introduced will have impact well beyond the crisis, Mr. Speaker. Over the summer, we brought in Thomson Reuters Case Line's digital document submission. It's a sharing e-filing system that will make it better for people who in remote or, or in-person matters. This has been called on by the profession and by the public for decades. We passed legislation to allow provincial offences courts to operate remotely and reduce in-person court appearances. We fast-tracked legislation to allow online notaries and commissioners. We're building a justice system that is more responsive, more resilient. It's better prepared to overcome not only this challenge but future challenges, Mr. Speaker. Initiatives like these I've mentioned they were previously regarded as too great to overcome, but we had a vision, we focused, we worked with our partners, and we got it done. And that, Mr. Speaker, to the member from Don Valley East, is how you connect the dots. Yeah. Next question, the member from London North Centre. My question is for the Minister of Education. Speaker, Every London parent's worst fear came true this week when a student tested positive for COVID-19 at HP Beale Secondary School. Parents have been sounding the alarm bell for months, demanding that this government take safety concerns in the classroom seriously. Instead, cases are going up and parents and students are waiting hours in line to get tested, if at all. Ontarians can't even gather in groups larger than 10 indoors unless it's a school. When will this government do the right thing and cap all class sizes at 15 before we see another outbreak in London schools? 
Minister of Education. Uh, well, thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, obviously, we have worked on a plan province-wide that's been supported and endorsed by the Chief Medical Officer of Health, an additional $1.3 billion of net investment, providing school boards with the financial latitude that they need to hire more educators, reduce classrooms, improve ventilation, and ultimately ensure that all the public health advice is implemented. Uh, speaker, in London, uh, for the Catholic and public school boards, they are well-resourced. They are hiring more educators. They have reduced the classroom sizes below the provincial average pre-COVID. Obviously, we'll continue to be there for them. We recognize the risk uh, it continues to evolve, and the province can need to continue to really do everything we can. And I think, at a more macro level, increasing capacity on testing, increasing um, you know vaccination for young people and for families. These are the types of steps that are going to help reduce the risk and improve the safety of our communities and our schools. The supplementary question, Speaker. Experts such as Sick Kids and RNAO don't support your bargain basement plan. COVID outbreaks in our schools should be a wake-up call for this government. Parents, like Lily in my riding, want to send their kids to school, but only if it's safe. Lily's son was supposed to start kindergarten in a class of 16 at Orchard Park Public School. Then she discovered that her son's class collapsed into a group of 26 students. Lily told me, Safety wasn't prioritized. Pedagogy wasn't prioritized. For the government, saving money means more than saving lives or providing the best education possible. It's a pandemic. We can no longer live like we did prior to March. Speaker, why is this minister forcing pre-pandemic class sizes on kindergartners instead of trying to keep them safe? Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, $35 million additional dollars provided to the uh, Thames Valley District School Board, an additional $10.6 million to the London uh, Catholic District School Board. Speaker, quite obviously, the Premier of the government is doing everything we can to provide the investments in place to our school boards to reduce classroom sizes, to improve ventilation, to hire more custodians and cleaning staff, and obviously, Speaker, to make sure our buses, playgrounds, and our classrooms are safe. In each and every level, in this province and in this country, we lead the nation by any measurement, more than twice the area of expenditure than the British Columbia New Democrats. Yeah. We're doing that because we understand, Speaker, the risk. We'll do everything we can in our province, communities, and most especially in our schools to reduce the risk and keep all students safe in Ontario. Order. The next question, the member for Guelph. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Long-Term Care. Back on May 28th, the Premier promised that we are now working to prepare our long-term care homes. We will spare no expense. The minister earlier in question period said there was a stabilization happening in long-term care, but frontline workers and healthcare leaders are saying nothing has changed and they're on the brink of another disaster. As of yesterday, there were outbreaks in 31 long-term care homes. Speaker, we all knew months ago about the staffing shortages in long-term care. So can the minister please tell this House and the people of Ontario how many new PSWs and registered nurses were hired over the summer for our long-term care homes? Great. Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. As I said, next week you will be hearing our comprehensive plan that addresses stabilization in our long-term care, including staffing, including IPAC, including Order. PPE. All of these efforts have been ongoing. In terms of our homes, the, the staffing uh, supports are there. We are not only um, looking at increasing PSWs from a number of sources, but we are also looking at using Order. and are using paramedics right now to support our homes in need. And, and, and to your comment about the outbreaks, I want to remind everyone that an outbreak in long-term care means one resident or one Response. staff member, and in the case of the staff member, that that person is is isolating at home. So the majority, 604 of our homes, have absolutely no resident cases. Thank you. Supplementary question. You know, Speaker, it breaks my heart actually that the minister can't tell us how many new PSWs or registered nurses were hired over the summer. We we all knew there was a staffing shortage. Like there was a report that said there was a staffing shortage. We knew a second wave was coming. We knew that our elders were the most vulnerable in long-term care. And now that we are in a second wave, to say that sometime maybe next week there might be some sort of plan released Shame. just isn't good enough. So, Order. Speaker, through you, I asked the minister why the government didn't hire additional 
personal support workers and registered nurses in our long-term care homes to protect our elders. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you Mr. for the long -term question. Care. Uh, the reality is you just don't snap your fingers and make staff appear. There is a process that we've been working very hard on since the very beginning. And not only PSWs, nurses, aides, we've created Member for Ottawa South come to order. The member for Davenport come to order. The member for Niagara Centre come to order. The member for Don Valley East come to order. The Minister of Long-Term Care to reply. Thank you, Speaker. The reality is the neglect left by the previous government is so severe that we are requiring to use flexible emergency orders, uh, amendments to regulations to be able to create training capacity in our long-term care homes, to create uh, a pipeline and recruitment process for PSWs. The neglect of the previous government was so severe, it set the stage for the issues. And we are working extremely hard to make sure we're using all tools, whether it's PSWs, nurses, IPAC control, paramedics, aides, and creating that flexibility for our homes. We will continue to do that despite the, the crisis that was left by the pre. I, I am about to move to warnings because of the repeated interjections from a number, a small number of members. Come to order. The next question, the member for Niagara, sorry, member for Richmond Hill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister, Minister, Sec, Minister of uh, Small Businesses. Many business owners I have spoken to in my community are facing significant challenges because of COVID-19. One of the biggest issues businesses are facing are outdated regulations. Ontario continues to have the highest number of regulatory requirements of any jurisdiction in Canada, in addition to an overly complex regulatory environment that hinders competitiveness by driving up costs and business. I want to like to thank you, the Minister, for coming to my riding in Richmond Hill, sharing at roundtables, talking to businesses and explain and share to them the situation, how to help them. Can you now tell the House how the government is taking action to make regulations better for people and businesses as they work towards recovery? Thank you. The Associate Minister of Small Business and Red Tape Production. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Richmond Hill, and especially for her leadership uh, in her community during this very uh, tough time. Uh, during this pandemic, uh, we have completed many roundtables and heard from many small business owners on the unique challenges that have been created by COVID-19. On April 28th, in response to many of these conversations, we launched the COVID-19 Tackling the Barriers web portal. This gave businesses the opportunity to pitch the government on temporary rule or process changes to help them get through this pandemic. After receiving over 1,300 submissions uh, and hosting over 90 roundtables, we have uh, implemented over 50 temporary changes and are investigating another 400. Some of these changes include enabling trucks to deliver 24-7 to areas across this province to keep our shelf stock, allowing municipalities to quickly pass temporary bylaws for the creation uh, of the extension of patios. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to remain committed to supporting businesses throughout. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Thank you very much, Minister. This is good news to small businesses. We know that because of the pandemic, small businesses continue to face many hurdles as they try to recover. Ontario still, need, still has too many regulations that are ineffective and outdated. Can you please tell the House how our plan can allow Ontario and its businesses to have more competitive advantage when it comes to unnecessary regulations so business and people can recover? Thank you, Minister. The Associate Minister. Thank you for that question. Making Ontario more competitive by having more efficient regulatory environment is a key priority of this government, something we have been focused on since being elected. We agree that less time on unnecessary regulations will free up Ontario businesses to focus on what is most important, 
recovering and re-emerging stronger than ever before. That is why we pay, passed a Made in Ontario plan for growth, renewal and economic recovery, one that is focused on modernizing rules, digitizing government and further tackling barriers that COVID-19 has created. Underpinning these changes to how Response. Ontario does business is our commitment to seven modernization principles for government to consider before making decisions, one of the most important being digitizing. We're going to continue to work hard to address these challenges. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Toronto, St. Paul. Speaker to the Premier. This week is Gender Equality Week across Canada, and I cannot think of a better time to remind this Conservative government that their broken COVID-19 policies have a disproportionate impact on the lives of women and their families. It is long overdue that they develop and implement an intersectional gender equity strategy, as I proposed last year. Rachel is my constituent. She's seven and a half months pregnant and is the mother of two elementary school children. She had to wait five plus hours to receive testing for her daughter at the Etobicoke General Hospital drive through Yes, you heard me correctly, Speaker, Etobicoke. In fact, she had to go twice as she went beforehand and had to wait hours for her son's testing. Premier, the long wait time for testing and for results has mentally exhausted Rachel. Also notably missing at the testing centres were enough public washrooms. There was one porter potty for the endless lineup. Premier, will you commit today to creating public testing centres in Toronto St. Paul's with extended hours, adequate staffing and public health resources so pregnant mothers like Rachel, with two kids strapped on her hip, don't have to travel cross-country to get a COVID test and fast results? Thank you very much. Yeah. Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. We are already taking steps to expand testing centres and capacity across the system. We have reached last weekend over 40,000 tests that we were able to do in one day. We are rapidly getting to the point where we will be able to process over 50,000 tests in one day, and we'll continue from there. But many of the assessment centres have already expanded their hours of service. They are. We've also created some uh, mobile pop-up centres to take some of the pressure away from some of the assessment centres. We have 148 of them across the province. We also have other groups that are coming in to do the testing. We have Yesterday, we made an announcement in Huntsville that as of Friday, there will be 60 pharmacies that will be available to test asymptomatic patients or residents, and we're going to continue to expand that. But we have been ramping up since the beginning of COVID-19, and we will continue to do that to alleviate the strain on the assessment centres. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. But, you know, if I suspect that I have COVID-19, I don't think it's smart for me to sh walk into a pharmacy where I could infect others, but that's just me. Premier, to the, to the Speaker, Order. many in St. Paul's are frustrated with having to travel outside of our community to get tested. I've been told by some of my constituents that they've left the line because they're afraid of losing their job. Speaker, the Premier promised all of us, the entire province, a robust COVID-19 fall preparedness plan, and we are still waiting. And while we are waiting, the COVID-19 numbers are soaring back to stage one numbers, and my community members have nowhere to go fast. The Premier appears to be saying yes to COVID-19 tests for sale, but no to families who expect and deserve access to free public health COVID-19 testing. Question. Again, my question is to the Premier. Will the Premier commit to creating public testing centres in St. Paul's, including mobile testing assessment centres, so that my constituents can access tests and results fast and nearer to home? Minister of Health, reply. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, I, I think it's really important to get back to the facts of the situation. The facts of the situation are that we are increasing capacity across the province, including across Toronto. Well, I can advise that uh, we have a 65% additional uh, 
assessment centre capacity being added to Toronto Region between September 23rd to September 30th. Five assessment centres have increased their hours and capacity this week, including Women's College, Sunnybrook, Michael Guerin, St. Joseph's and Order. St. Michael's. We are Order. adding increased volumes. And with respect to the testing in pharmacies, it will be asymptomatic patients or, or residents who are referred there. The situation is that the member for Toronto St. Paul's will come to order. I apologize to the Minister of Health. Please wind up your answer. Thank you, Speaker. In fact, uh, there will be a requirement to make an appointment to go to a pharmacy. They will be pre-screened there to make sure that they do not have symptoms. They will also be screened upon their arrival at the pharmacy to ensure the safety of the staff in the pharmacy as well as the people that are shopping there. We recognize that there will be many seniors Response. there. We want them to be safe, so we have put in all of those safety precautions for pharmacies. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Mississauga Centre. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the Minister of French Affairs. Now more than ever, with extraordinary circumstances that we're facing, it's important that our government listen to all the actors, all the community actors, so that we can respond to their needs. I would like to thank the non-for-profit French organizations for their efforts during the pandemic to help the most vulnerable among us. Together, we donate meals to French, uh, to French Ontarians, and we also donated we also donated tools and equipment, medical equipment, to our first frontline workers. So my question is. How does the minister make sure that she listens to the French, uh, Franco Ontarian community? Thank you, Mr. Pre thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to my colleague for her very important question. Before the pandemic, I was always consulting the the provincial committee for the French affairs in Ontario. I traveled across the, the province to talk to Frank, Frank, Franco Ontarians and to talk about this, the, the difficulties that they're facing on the ground. And we also organized uh, roundtables. At the beginning of the pandemic, I also met with the Franco Ontarian organization to understand the effects of the pandemic on them. And we also created a committee for the uh, economic French recovery. We also, in this committee, we had Guy Matt, who is the leader of the uh, Franco-Ontarian uh, discussion. And we have other committees from Toronto that came from all, from all different areas. Thank you. Question. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mrs. Uh, Minister, for your reply, and thank you for your support through my bill and to have made it a reality. This afternoon, after after the adoption of the one the, the bill 182, now the Franco-Ontarian flag would join the other emblem of Ontario's. Tomorrow is the Franco-Ontarian Day a community that shares strong values that are entrenched in the history of our province. How would you ensure that everybody recognize the important impact of the Franco-Ontarian community in Ontario? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to my co-worker. It's under her leadership that we finally adopted the Franco-Ontarian flag as an official emblem of Ontario, and I thank her for her work on this important file. Mr. Speaker, I also work with Franco-Ontarian organizations in order to find solutions to the challenges that Franco-Ontarians are facing because of COVID-19. We had many productive conversations and we understand the importance of Francophonie and we're trying to strengthen uh, this community and we will implement a series of recommendations and concrete measures. We're trying to improve uh, French services and the access to French services. We're also trying to support the Franco-Ontarian community in their cultural and economic uh, and, and their economic opportunity in Ontario. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. This week I heard from a parent in my riding, Angela Gamsby, whose two children attend elementary school in Port Coburn. She's a frontline health care worker and unable to keep her children home from school because she's busy being a hero at work. Her son's class has 29 students. Her daughter's has 28. The kindergarten class has 30 kids in one classroom. Will the Premier listen to the people in Niagara and across Ontario, listen to the evidence, and commit to keeping our children safe by capping class sizes at 15 students? Minister of Education. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member opposite for the question. In Niagara District School Board, for example, that board has been provided with an additional $71 million more million to ensure they could do more hiring. In that board, we've actually seen 20 new public health nurses being hired specifically for schools, doubling the capacity that existed before COVID. We've also seen, Speaker, additional funding in mental health, in technology to make sure low-income families at risk get access to Chromebooks and to internet, additional funding for custodians, a million dollars roughly, Speaker, an additional investment in ventilation, over a million dollars there alone to improve air quality. Speaker, we appreciate having been to Niagara, specifically with the parliamentary assistant, and getting to uh, visit a public and Catholic school, I was able to see firsthand the professionalism of our staff, the hard work on the ground, and our absolute commitment we have together to reduce the risk in our Response. schools. Response. The supplementary question. Speaker, my own son is in a 12-year-old son's in a class with 27 kids. No one knows where this minister is getting his numbers from or his facts from. What people in Ontario do know is that if we're going to keep our kids safe, we have to make uh, decisions based on evidence, not make up evidence based on decisions. <laughs> Just this week, a high school in Niagara, East Hill Secondary School in Welland, declared an outbreak. The Niagara Public Health Pandemic Hotline has been overwhelmed with parents concerned about the safety of their children. Parents are understandably worried about sending their children back into crowded classrooms where social distancing is impossible. This minister and this government had a chance to do the right thing last week and vote with us to cap class sizes at 15. They chose not to. Question. My constituents are telling me that they trusted this government to keep children safe. This government let them down. Why is this minister unwilling and unprepared to solve this crisis in our classrooms? Minister of Education. Well, Speaker, in the context of deferring to science and evidence, let's listen to Dr. Herji, the acting medical officer of Niagara, where he said, and I quote, given the situation right now, given the very sensible measures the province has recommended be put in place, I certainly think going back for in-person learning is very reasonable for children to be doing at this time. This was said just on the eve of back to school, Speaker. The chief medical officer of health of this province, the foremost authority that has provided advice to the cabinet to help us get through the worst of this pandemic, has given his full stamp of approval, knowing full well that we have deferred to the signs, ensuring layers of prevention, improving air quality, masking in our schools, improving cleaning in our schools, hiring more educators to ensure we distance these kids, cohorting them as well, Speaker, Response. as taking action to stagger the start. We are listening to the science. We'll continue to do so to do everything we can to make sure that all of our children are safe in this province. The next question, the member for Markham Unionville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Infrastructure. Last week, the Minister announced that all three levels of government would be working together to deliver much needed public transit funding to the Durham region. I am even more proud to know that Ontario has invested nearly $40 million toward 11 new public transit infrastructure projects in Durham. This funding will go towards installing new protective shields on the Durham public transit buses that will provide a physical barrier between transit users and transit vehicle operators. The region now also replaced 11 conventional buses with the region's first hybrid electric buses, reducing emissions and fuel costs while providing transit users with a modern, safe and efficient transit system. Would the minister Tell us what this investment means to transit users in Durham region. Thank you. Minister of Infrastructure. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for asking the question today. And what a fantastic uh, day it was for transit users in Durham. As the member mentioned, our announcement means a lot to Durham region and surrounding communities. Making investment in public transit infrastructure will get people where they need to go safely and on time. For example, let me share a story, Jacob's story. 
Jacob is a second-year animation student at Durham College in Oshawa. He lives in Bowmanville and relies on public transit to get to class. With our nearly $40 million investment, Jacob can now look forward to a shorter, safer, and more reliable commute. It's stories like Jacob's that highlight the importance of making local priority transit infrastructure investments, Mr. Speaker, and I hope there will be more to come. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Back to the minister. We've all heard the minister and the premier both said that our government is investing $144 billion, yes, with a B, in Ontario infrastructure over 10 years for broadband connectivity, transit and highways, schools and hospitals. And we know that this is a record, this is a record level infrastructure investment. While I'm glad that Durham Region received this transit funding, the need for infrastructure renewal across the province remains. There are potholes so large on some roads that cause damages to vehicles. And for many people, broadband infrastructure is so out of date that it is difficult to work and learn from home efficiently at a time when the need for reliable broadband has increased. Mr. Speaker, Ontario needs more support to address its very real infrastructure deficit. So to the Minister, when can Durham Region and other communities across Ontario expect more investment like this one last week? That's thank you, Mr. Point. Speaker. Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member for his great question again. Ontario nominated public transit infrastructure projects to the federal government under the Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program, or ICIP. The projects announced in Durham are part of more than 200 public transit projects we've submitted for review, and we're waiting for federal approval on several more. But we can't do it alone. That's why Premier Doug Ford has called on the federal government to speed up approvals uh, and invest an additional $10 billion per year over 10 years to catch shovels in the ground on infrastructure projects, and that includes broadband, Mr. Speaker. Through strategic investments, we can continue to help improve the quality of life for all Ontarians. It's time for Ontario to get its fair share of funding and get those shovels in the ground. Thank you very much. That concludes our question period for this morning. There being no further business, this House stands in recess until 1 p.m.